<clears throat> so, good afternoon to all of you. I'm Pranam. Thank you all for coming. And uh, today we are starting in a series of lectures after finishing with our Gopi Gita series some weeks ago. Today we are starting with the Raghavarma Chandrika by Sri Vishwana Chakrabarti Thakur. Moon ray illuminating the path of spontaneous devotion. So we will be meeting each other on Mondays and Thursdays. Who knows for how long, but I think it will be like for at least a month or so. So <clears throat> today we will give some introduction hmm, to the whole book, to the work, to its author. And also we will be sharing some of its main verses, especially the first two ones of the first part of the book, which will act, serve as both introduction to the work and also invocation, Mangal Charam. So, well, mainly I also decided to, of course, I asked Guru Maharaj for his blessings and his opinion regarding starting with this particular mm -hmm. series now. <clears throat> and he agreed. Uh, and the idea mainly be behind choosing this particular work was that, well, for the last maybe three months or so, we have been sharing some different series of, series of lectures in English uh, connected to Panchatattva, connected to Gaurashtakaliya Lila, connected to Sikshastakam, connected to Gopi Gita. So especially in the last series, we were really going deep into the idea of Rasa and Bhava and the different emotional uh, undulations that manifest both in Gaur Lila as well as in Krishna Lila by going through the eight periods, eternal periods of the day of Mahaprabhu and all the different uh, emotional waves coming there and after that we went deep into Krishna Lila in the form of Gopi Git. Of course there was Tattva Siddhanta philosophy but mainly we were connected to how the bhav or the moods of the inhabitants of both Navadip and Braj were playing out. So I consider that as a complement to, to this series it was it will be interesting to stop for a moment those type of narratives and entering more in detail into the philosophical foundation of the Raga Mark, of the path of Raga Nuga Bhakti, her spontaneous devotion, the one which we are being part of. So I consider this will be, this will give much more strength to our Shravan and Kirtan, to our engagement in Bhakti by hearing about the Lilas in Braj, the hearing the Lilas about Gore in Navadip. No? It's important to nurture that uh, experience, if you will, with a proper conceptual orientation, if you will, and proper foundation regarding what's the how to say no what's the yeah the philosophical background regarding the experience of Raga Bhakti. So Raga Varma Chandrika will be a very interesting book in that regard, as we will see with the introduction today. <clears throat> so mainly this is the idea. We're trying to go through this study and become thus uh, more aware of which is the school we are being part of, which is the, the, the ideal that is being delivered in this particular Gaudiya Sampradaya. Raga Marga is our path. Mahaprabhu himself came to share that path to the world. That was his specialty. And he gave that in a very, in a very unique way, as you know, to penetrate Tamrita mentions. Prima Rasani Riyasa Kurita Shudam Raga Marga Bhakti Loki Kurita Pracharam. So it's very nicely summarized uh, the different reasons for Mahaprabhu coming to this world. First, Prema Rasani Riyasa Kurita Ashwadam. He's coming to Ashwadam to relish Prema Ras, the different moods, the different mellows of sacred aesthetic rapture. That was his main. Reason for descent, descending, rather mm -hmm. tasting, rather vibe in few, few words. But as a byproduct of that, because of the overflowing of such an experience, we have Raga Marga Bhakti Loki Kurite Pracharam. Mm -hmm. So he came to do prachar, mm -hmm. to do dissemination in the world, Bhakti Loki, Loki in this material world, he came to Raga Marga Bhakti. 
to disseminate the teachings about Raga Marga Bhakti, about the path hmm, of devotional path which follows hmm, in the footsteps in the wake of the mood of the inhabitants of Raj, as we will see. So this is what Mahaprabhu uh, tasted in a particular way, of course. We cannot imitate that, but we can we can follow and we can honor and embrace the distilled, if, if you will, result of such an experience in the form of the gift that both he and Nityananda Prabhu also in connection to him came are given to the world in this Raga Marga. Sampradaya we are part of. So it's very important that we be, know about our inheritance, if you will, our our own tradition and which are the the yeah the, which is the foundation the philosophical foundation for the emotion for the rag because we are part of the raga marga rag means attachment passion and passionate love sacred read as you will like to call it <laughs> sacred passion so behind that there is a whole hmm, tattoo and siddhanta for us to engage in this not in a sentimental way hmm, but in a well thought out way and we will be able to draw take much more advantage we do so so i i'll try to to share this hmm, uh, along this series hopefully by the blessings of sri guru and goranga so some brief idea of why we are specifically hmm, going through raghavarma chandrika here so let me begin with some brief introduction to the author hmm, of this work which is the most revered srila vishwanatra kavarti thakur hmm. All of you have heard about him, but we can never hear enough. So let's hear some words about him and about his special, special position uh, in order uh, when, when the moment of speaking about Raga Marga comes. You now he's a very uh, empowered and inspired personality to speak about this particular topic. So that's very important as well to acknowledge. So Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, as you know, he comes, he's coming his fourth in the line of the disciple succession coming from Narottam Das Thakur. His guru was called Radha Raman Chakrabharti. And many consider this Ranat Chakrabharti Thakur an incarnation of Rupa Goswami. So now, of course, when I say an incarnation, in which sense he's Rupa Goswami? Now, he's not literally an incarnation in every sense of the term, but I will say he's an incarnation of Sri Rupa in a representational way in all that he represents through his teachings and writings and commentaries and books in the line of what Sri Rupa Goswami Pad delivered. And that's very important. That's a lot to say because for us Rupa Goswami is the all in all, if you will. We are considered to be Rupa Nugas, followers, followers in the footsteps of Sri Rupa. So Vishwanath is considered by many to be in that line, to be such a representative hmm, of the gist of the substance of what Rupa Goswami came to give. Hmm? Mainly in connection to his profuse writings and how these writings were saturated uh, with divine mellows. Remember, Sri Rupa Goswami is the Rasa Charya between the six Goswamis, different Goswamis had been empowered by Mahaprabhu for different uh, tasks. And Rupa Goswami is known as the Abhideya Charya, but also the Rasa Charya. And that's why he wrote about Rasa in such detail, especially in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, a whole ocean, a whole oceanic expression of Rasa. So Rupa Goswami is the Rasa Charya. And in Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, we find profuse writings quite saturated with Rasa as well, very much in the line of what Sri Rupa gave. And he, Vishwanath Chakravarti Pad, he also very clearly, both by precept, both by personal uh, behavior, he established the path of Raga Bhakti. Of course, that Rupa Goswami was the original one, as we will see, who delineated our particular conception of the Raga Mark. But Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur further, how they say, they pound, pounding the post you know, more and more in different situations along his life. I, I won't now enter into detail about all the different uh, situations in Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's life, but he, for example, refuted Rupa Kaviraj, who was someone who was proposing a very distorted, distorted idea of the Raga Mark. He blessed Baladev Vidyabhushan to write the Gubinda Vashya, the famous and Gaudiya commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. Mm -hmm. He had a, a very deep revelation 
of Srimati Radharani regarding the meaning of Kama Gayatri and certain half syllable he was not able to to find and Sri Radha herself revealed to him and he really reestablished if you will also the doctrine of uh, Parakiyavad hmm, over this Fakiya conception which somehow or other was prevalent at his time hmm. so in different ways he was really someone who established the path of spontaneous devotion especially through his books also of course and he wrote very profusely he wrote many books actually among the Gaudi Acharyas there are very few who wrote so many books as many books as Srila Chakrabarti Thakur mm -hmm. so and, and there are especially three books that are mentioned mm -hmm. I mean there are many books but there are three that are especially dear for the Gaudi community and also because they are especially um, in line to what Rupa Goswami wrote because they are actually commentaries to books that Sri Rupa Goswami wrote so there are three books, and there is even a proverb, if you will, very short one, which says, Kirana Bindu Khan Eitina Niya Vaishnava Pan, which means three books, Kirana, Bindu, and Khan, and I will say which are, are taken by the Vaishnavas as the wealth, the whole wealth. So what is Kirana, Bindu, and Khan? Kirana refers to the Ujval Nilamani Kirana, <clears throat> which is a commentary that Vishwanath wrote to Rupa Goswami Sushpal and Nilamani, which is a sequel to the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu focused in Madhuri Bhav. Kirana means like a ray, a ray coming from, from this jewel of divine love, romantic love. Then you have Bindu, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Bindu, who wrote. Also, it's a commentary by Vishwanath on the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Rupa Goswami. And then we have the Kana, which means Bhagavatam Rita Kana, which is a commentary written by Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur to Srila Rupa Goswami's Lago Bhagavad Tambrita, hmm? which speaks a lot about different incarnations and avatars and divine descents and so on. Hmm? So these three books are really dear. All of them are very dear, but this holds are whole in special place because also of, it shows very clearly how Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur is hmm? so much in line with Sri Rupa. And we will see that even in the first verse of the Raghavarma Chandrika. Because the Raghavar Machandrika will be an elaboration on Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu as well, an extension of his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu. Of course, he, only, he did not only wrote, write this, these three books, he wrote many other books, some of them quite well known to you as the Madhurya Kadambini. Also, he wrote, I don't know, a very nice book called the Chamatkar Chandrik, very, with lots of uh, joking mood, Prem Samput famous locket of love, uh, different commentary, commentary to the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, apart from the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu, commentary to Lalita Madhava, commentary to Brahma Sanhita, unfinished commentary to Chaitanya Charitamrita, Ujval Nilamani commentary, commentary to the Gopal Tapani Upanishad, commentary to the Bhagavad Gita, his famous commentary to the Srimad Bhagavatam, Sarartha Darshini, historical, very rustic commentator. And other works, very famous works that also are very fundamental for the Vaishnav, especially the ones atta attached to the <clears throat> rustic sensibilities of Gaudiya Vedanta, like Krishna Baba Nambrita, and of course, this also Raghavarma Chandrika. Mm -hmm. So it is due to, to his extraordinary con literary contribution that also the Gaudiya Vaishnava Acharyas have composed. You now, there is a famous verse or pranam, bar, pranam mantra where we can use to offer our uh, indebtedness to Sri Vishwanathra Kavarti Thakur Vishwasya Nata Rupa Sho Bhakti Bhatma Pradarshanat Bhakta Chakra Bharti Tattva Chakra Bharti Akhyaya Bhavat which basically means because he indicates the path of bhakti he is known by the name Vishwanath the Lord of the Universe and because he always remains in the assembly or circle, which is translated as chakra, which means circle, of pure devotees, he is known by the name Chakravarti. So this pranam mantra further elucidates on the position of Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. He's illuminating the path of bhakti for the whole world, it says here. Now, Vishwasya Natarupusho Bhakti Bhatma Pradarshanat. He's pointing into the direction of bhakti marga and a particular type of bhakti marga which is raga marga 
Raghavatma Chandrika. That's why, that's the name of the book we will see it now. And they call him Vishwanath. Vishwanath means Lord of the Universe, which also is the name of, Bish, of Mahadev, Lord Shiva, which is also considered Vaishnavanam hmm, Jatasambhu, uh, the best of Vaishnavas. So it's another way of saying Vishwanath, he's the best of Vaishnavas. Hmm. He has attained a very like, <clears throat> distinguished position among the community of the Buddhists, and that's why he's called Chakrabarti. Hmm. Not only because he remains in the chakra, in the circle of the Bodhis, because chakra means like wheel or circle, and Bharti means to recite. So chakra Bharti means one who recites in a circle or community, in this case of Vaishnavas. But also in this case, regarding someone of the stature of Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur, you could say that the idea of Bharti, which means recites, also conveys the sense of like an axis around which the wheel rotates. So in this case, Chakrabarti will mean, will refer to that person who is the axis around whom the whole Gaudiya community is revolving. So of course we will be further inclined into that interpretation of the idea of Chakrabarti. So by his writings, by his commentaries, by his contribution, he's making the whole Gaudiya community revolve around that, around such a content. So in this series, we will have a glimpse of only one and very brief work of Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur, but we pray that that may be <clears throat> more than enough, at least to begin and to continue mm, trading this path of Raga. Mm. So <clears throat> after some brief introduction to the author of the book, <clears throat> and before going to the first two verses of of the Raghavarma Chandrika, let me give some brief introduction to the Raghavarma Chandrika in itself, to the work, to the present work. So this is a quite relatively small treatise. It only contains 21 verses. Actually, some of them are verses, some of them are prose, no? will be like entire paragraphs. So in one sense, we say 21 verses, but some of them you will see they are considerably long. But it's, it's still relatively uh, short or small in comparison to, to other topics. And especially from the perspective of, uh, of how many things Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur wrote. But at the same time, the subject matter is so exalted. So it's a very great book. Even though it seems small in size, the content is very spacious, very deep, very unending. So the name of the book, let's go for a minute to the idea of the name. What's the meaning of the name of the book? Raga Bhardma Chandrika. This is the name that Vishwanath chose to give to his work. So Raga Bhardma Chandrika, which means again, like a moon ray, Chandrika means like a moon ray. Chandra means moon and Chandrika means like a ray of the moon. Bhardma means which shows which uh, points to, which in this case illuminates, as a moon ray will do, Raga, the path of Raga, Raga mark. So sometimes there are different analogies that are give, being given in order to further elucidate this point. For example, during Amavasya, which was two days ago, which is the day of the new moon, which means there's no moon. No? This is the day where Gadadhar Pandit disappeared from the world. Also Gadadhar Pandit appeared in the world in that same day no moon, so there is a dark moon, if you will. So the moon is not visible, that's the point. So and the night, of course, will be very dark. So sometimes the example is there, there may be a very narrow pathway somewhere there, but it will be unseen due to darkness. So in, in, the, in case the moon were, were to be visible, of course, naturally, some of those rays will reveal that particular path. So the point is that this book is acting as one of those moon rays that will illuminate for us the path, the particular path, the, the path that is taking us into the direction of Vrindavan, Raghavarma Chandrika. <clears throat> so this book is a moon ray, it's a Chandrika that will be casting its light on the path of Rag uh, in the midst of darkness, of the darkness, if you will, of of material existence, in the darkness of our own conditioning, we will receive illumination by this and nurturing. No? As you know, the moon is not only given light in darkness, but it's given taste to the to the food, as Krishna says in the Gita, it's given nurturing 
to so many species. So in this way, this type of book would enlighten us, nurture us, and give us a higher taste, if you will. Rag has to do, has to do with that. So this is the analogy, you know, like it, like it just as a traveler, you know, like a traveler can really find its way, his way, her way, when the moon rays are illuminating a very complex path, inaccessible path, and the, and the traveler will be, in a, will be able to arrive eventually, happily, at his um, destination without having to fall into ditches or be pricked by thorns, without having to go with certain difficulties that could be avoided in the same way as sadhakas who are treading the difficult path of ragavakti one sense we will see it's easy but at the same time there are some difficulties there are some things to to consider and there's a very exclusive specific path that we need to really understand in order to tread it properly so in that way there are some com complexities in the way but in the same way as a traveler can find his way, her way through by the grace of the moon rays, in the same way we will become duly acquainted hmm, with this path by taking shelter in this book and blissfully attain, attain the destination that this book is pointing us to, hmm, which is again the goal of Raghavakti, which corresponds with the eternal land of Raj. And of course, its corresponding simultaneous manifestation in the form of Nityanavati. Hmm. Hmm. So this is the meaning of the book. No? It refers to a moon ray, again, Chandrika, which is indicating Bhartma or illuminating in the context of the analogy here, the path of spontaneous devotion, no? Raga. Raga, Bharma, Chandrika. So it's a moon ray, again, it's also nurturing. And being a moon ray, the book will be divided in two parts. I mean, not because being a moon ray, but the name of the two parts are called illuminations or Prakash. Prakash has to do with illumination. So first illumination we'll call Pratama Prakash, Pratam Prakash, and the second one we'll call Dvitiya Prakash, which means first illumination and second illumination, basically. So in the first illumination that we will be, of course, studying along some weeks, I think there are like 14 verses in the first one, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so in the first illumination, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur will try to ascertain hmm, both the paths of Bhaiti Bhakti as well as Raga Bhakti. Hmm. Speak about Bhaiti in order to further clarify hmm, what's the meaning of, uh, of Rag. Hmm. So on one side we will have Bhaiti and Raga Nuga Bhakti, a deliberation of the two of them. That will be the main topic of the first illumination. What's Raga Bhakti? by comparison, by contrast with Bhaiti Bhakti and so on, coming and going. That will be a very healthy and useful method that he will use. And the second illumination, somehow or other, we'll be speaking about something else, but at the same time in connection to the first part. And there, um, Vishwanath will present uh, concepts, different concepts in relation to Krishna's aspect of Aishwarya and Madhurya. Hmm? of opulence and intimacy, of majesty and sweetness, which at the same time are somehow connected. No? Ashwarya with Vaidhi, Madhurya with Rag. So it's another way of continuing speaking about the same topic, but from a different vantage form. So that will be the main topic of uh, the second illumination. Ashwarya, Madhurya, and also how this Ashwarya is present in Madhurya, in a particular form for it to be Madhurya. But well, that will be the topic of those talks. So some introduction hmm, to both the author of the work and the work itself. So we will begin today with the first two verses of this first illumination, which at the same time these two verses will be an introduction hmm, to the work. You know, the first verse being in Mangala Charan and the second verse will be speaking about the purpose of the book. So I decided to include these two in, in today's first class, which is somehow or other an introduction to the whole treaties. So <clears throat> I will read with you the verse, first verse of first illumination, which again is the Mangala Charan. So it says like this. Oh, let me share it with you in the chat so you can have it as well. I mean, so 
So there you there you have the the verse both in Sanskrit and with the translation in English. So it says Shri Rupa Bakshudashadi Chakure Bhya Namo Namaha Yesham Kripa Lavai Bakshi Raga Bhatmani Chandrikam. So the translation says with great humility and veneration I offer obeisances again and again to those devotees who, like Chakora birds, are always relishing the nectarine rasa of Sri Rupa Goswami's words on the strength of just a slight merciful glance up from them. I am beginning this book, which is like a moonbeam illuminating the path of spontaneous devotion. So here we have the the very first verse of Raghubhartma Chandrika, which is again a Mangala Charan. As you know, Mangala Charan means what we do, no? an engagement for auspiciousness, basically. Before starting some particular treatise or whatever activity, Mangala Charan is there in order that whatever we are doing will be blessed. And we'll have, we, are, we will request specific blessings according to the specific thing we are about to do. So here it's a very clear well, Sri Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur is beginning to speak about Raghavarti. So first, he's begging his blessings for Rupa Goswami and his followers, because he is there again, the Rasa Charya, the one who established officially in our sampradaya this idea. So, of course, being instructed by Mahaprabhu and so on, but he did in a very systematic way through his books and so on. So he's asking for that particular blessing here. <clears throat> to be able basically to engage in such a task. This is the, the, main, the main blessing. And he's extending, of course, this idea, not only to Sri Rupa, but as well to the whole Rupa Nuga members of the Sampradaya. So let's go, let's unpack a little bit of the, the meaning of this particular verse before going to the next one. So we'll see, we already, I think you already know about that, but as we will see further, this Raga Bharma, Riz Raga Marga, sorry, this path of devotion, spontaneous devotion is very unique, very unusual, very uh, astonishing for many, in many senses. It's very rarely attained, even though it's totally open to all by Mahaprabhu's grace. At the same time, it's not so easy to understand and to appreciate. We are here speaking about the path that takes us to, the, to that land where God is no longer God, basically, where we will find God in his presentation as Krishna, who is God beyond God. So that's already a very, <laughs> very refined theolog theological proposal. Not everyone will be able to grasp such an idea. So that's my point. Now we are speaking about a particular path with its corresponding goal, all of which are, it's really, um, in one sense, theologically complex, very delicate. So we require a particular type of mercy to enter there. If, if we do not reserve, receive that particular mercy, it will be very difficult to enter without that, without the mercy of those saints who are living hmm, in such a world, who are projecting themselves there, or even who are coming from such a world, as in the case of Sri Rupa Goswami. So he's Vipanachra Kavartha Thakur is praying hmm, to them, he's praying to those saints who are inhabiting hmm, this idea of Raga Mark, even though they are not need to see this, but they are sadhana siddha, so they are on the path to be that. He's praying to them, and what to speak, he's praying to Rupa and all the Goswami who are those members of this divine retinue who are descending along with Mahaprabhu to deliver this to the world. Without the mercy, as we will see a bit further when, when he speaks about how to enter Raga Mark, it's so crucial to receive the grace of those saints that are really imbibed into this particular mood. So here, the author, the Grantakar, which is another word for author, the one who is making the Granta, the one who is writing the book, therefore Vishwanath is praising here. Those devotees that are following in the footsteps of Sri Rupa, and he compares them to Chakora birds. Chakora birds. Chakora is this bird that only is living by drinking the rays of the moon. We have the Chakora bird and you have the Chataka bird. The Chataka is the one who only subsists by the strength of water from the rain, coming from the rain. And the Chakora bird is another type of bird which is just subsisting, surviving by the moon rays. He's only living 
from those things that come from above. Even if you bring the bird so many things from here, he will be just determined in taking that thing that comes from above. In this case, the analogy is further extending. We are speaking about moon ray, and here speaking about the devotees of Rupa Goswami, Chakora birds who survive on, on, on that particular moonlight. So Vishwanath is praising here those devotees who are really eager for one drop of such mercy. That moon ray is compared to the mercy. And from the most important of the Goswamis, if you will, if we have to establish one of the six Goswamis as the most important, again, not in a relative sense, best, worst, better, or whatever, but we know the Rupa Goswami is occupying a very special place, and that's why we are called mainly Rupa Nugas. We are also, of course, Sanata Nugas and Jiva Nugas, but we are mainly considered as Rupa Nugas, Srila Rupa Goswami Path, who has been especially empowered by Mahaprabhu to represent Mahaprabhu's own experience and decode that in such a way that the whole world, that nowadays, today, June 22 of 2020, we could be now trying to drink with some thirst one of these nectary moon rays. If some Adhikar came to us, that Adhikar is only by the grace of Rupa, Mahaprabhu, Rupa Goswami and his representatives. So that's why we are called Rupa Nugas mainly. There are two ways, of course, of conceiving the idea of Rupa Nugas, you know. I won't enter into those, that detail. Um, Rupa Nuga, maybe you follow Rupa Goswami in his perfected form as Rupa Manjuri, and you are aspiring to serve under his guidance, her guidance, the concept of Manjuri Bhav. That's one type of Rupa Nuga, but also Rupa Nuga means to be a follower of Rupa Goswami, and all Gaudiya Vaishnavas are considered Rupa Nuga in that sense to follow into his teachings, precepts, example, what he established as what we call nowadays as Gaudiya Sampradaya. So Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur again, he's about to speak about the path of Rag, who has been originally established by Rupa Goswami. His Ragabharna Chandrika is an extended uh, commentary on the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. So naturally he's going to Rupa Goswami first, who, whom he is representing, as we know, he's considering a representational incarnation of Sri Rupa Goswami. So he's going to him, but he's also expressing his dependence, not only on Rupa Goswami, but on those devotees, on the grace of those devotees who are following him like Chakora birds, while he's starting his book. That's a very important point. Sometimes we, our, our misfortune, our Dur Daivam, is that we don't feel the necessity of getting grace, of being blessed, in our devotional engagement. And we conduct ourselves from an independent mood. And that's, of course, why the result of such engagement is not very interesting, if you will. But as much as we progress, as we much will say yes, was saying yesterday, as much as you get closer to the goal, you will realize how much dependent you are on mercy. Even though you, are, you have to do your part, your effort, but mercy is playing the biggest role. So here, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur feels himself fully dependent on Rupa Grace, Rupa's Grace, and Rupa Nuga's and devotee's Grace. So before starting the book, he's praying to them, like implying, may I be a, an instrument, your instrument to compose this. May I not be the ultimate author of this work, but you will be the author, and I just be a puppet in your hands. That will guarantee success in my task, in my endeavor. So in this way, of course, it's not only Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, the one who has to pray for Rupa Nuga's grace or to engage in Mangala Charan, but we sadhakas, how much more should also try to understand all the things properly, how we should, we need to understand the secrets of the path of Raghunuga Bhajan. There are lots of secrets, and secret means something that can be known, but won't be known without mercy, basically. Krishna says in the Gita, Raja Vidya Raja Guhyam. This is a secret knowledge. Upanishad means come closer, as Guru Raj will say. I will tell you a secret. So to, to, to hear the secret, to grasp the secret, you, get, you need to go to get closer. And closer means not a physical, geographical approximation, but you get closer to the revelation by surrender, by submission. That's how you get closer. Srila Prabhupada makes, makes that point when he translates Tadvidi Pranipatena, he translates Pranipat as surrender, but also as approach a spiritual master. 
approach spiritual mantra means surrender in that direction. So that you will get closer and you will be able to hear better the secrets. Now we are hearing some secrets on some level because we get to some distance closer, but we maybe didn't get fully closer to that source of revelation. So we are not able to fully grasp all the secrets that are being delivered. So as sadhakas, we need to understand this point and gradually enter more and more into this secret realm of revelation, especially in the context of Raga, Marga, Raga, Nuga, Bhajan. But we understand entering into that arena has to be done in the context of dependence on, on great souls. That's the only way that I can really advance. That mercy will actually push me more and more into the inner circle of this revelation. We have to follow. We will speak Raga Nuga. Anuga means to follow, to follow the examples, to follow the precepts of the great personalities. That's our identity. Anugatya. This is the conception. Anugati means to follow, the following in the footsteps of these great stalwarts. Hmm. So Sila Rupa Goswami is mentioning here, mentioned here, and you may already have an idea why, what's the role, what's the position, what's the significance of Sri Rupa for us as, um, as Gaudiya and Vaishnavas. But let's share some brief words in order to, to properly extol hmm, Srila Rupa Goswami's glories, at least briefly, briefly, but to understand again, where do we belong to? Because we may begin our trajectory, devotional trajectory, and we are with the devotees, but we may be not that acquainted yet, of who, which is our lineage, who are the personalities here, which is the mood of worship, all those things will be coming gradually in time to us. And we need to acknowledge our legacy, if you will, to properly represent that in practice, in precept. So as I said, Rupa Goswami has been especially empowered by Mahaprabhu to represent him by the grace of Sri Chaitanya Dev. Uh, he, Rupa Goswami is the one who established the Raga Bhajan, which is so dear to Mahaprabhu. We, we, we know the, this, the official Pranam Mantra to Rupa Goswami, Sri Chaitanya Manovishtam Shtapitam Yenabhutale Sayam Rupa Dayamahyam Dadati Swapadantikam. So there it is to say, Sri Chaitanya Mano Abhishtam, Abhishtam, those desires that went in the mana, in the mind of Sri Chaitanya, Sri Chaitanya Mano Abhishtam, Sapitam Yenabhutali, he says. No? He established those desires in the world. Rupa Goswami took the mind of Mahaprabhu and made that mind, express the mind of Mahaprabhu, which were inside the mind of Mahaprabhu. He, that took it form in the, in, in the writings, in the teachings, in the process delineated by Rupa Goswami. He knew what was in Mahaprabhu's mind, in every sense of the term. You know the famous case when Mahaprabhu was singing this secular song in Rath Yatra, and, no, and some people was like disconcerted why he's singing this. And Rupa Goswami composed in Sanskrit verse, his own version of what really Mahaprabhu meant by speaking in direct language in Rath Yatra, in the mood of Radha, speaking Parokshabad, suggested meaning, not saying it plainly, overtly. Rupa Goswami wrote a verse like show really how it, this was Radha speaking in separation of Sri Hari. And Mahaprabhu eventually found that verse and he, he was like ashamed and said to Mahaprabhu like, oh, how do you know my mind that well? How were you able to say this? <laughs> so the point is Rupa Goswami knew Mahaprabhu is Krishna trying to relish Radha Bhav. So he was able to express all this. He himself composed this verse Rupa Goswami. Speaking about what Mahaprabhu came to give to the world, his Unnata Uchwala Rasa, he himself spoke about that in his Uchwal Nilamani and so on. So, in connection to how to attain such a gift, what Mahaprabhu came to give, the distilled version of his own inner experience in the form of Radha Bhav, in the form of Manjari Bhav, and by extension, in association with Nityananda Prabhu in the form of Priyanarma Sakyabhav, all those things, how to attain such a gift that is the Gaudiya Sampradaya is trying to extend to us. Well, for that, Rupa Goswami mainly composed two books, Sri Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu and its Madhurya Rasa sequel, if you will, in the form of Pujval Nilamani. He speaks about Madhurya Rasa and Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, but very briefly. He spends a whole book to speak about that in the Uchpal Nilamani. So he wrote these books 
to make all this topic, which is really difficult to comprehend at one point, this subject matter of Raga Marga, he made it much more accessible by writing these books. He made it much more approachable to the sadhakas of the world. So we are really greatly benefited and blessed by Rupa Goswami's contribution. Of course, later some other acharyas wrote about Raga Marga, Raga Bhajan, Dhyana Chandra Goswami spoke about that in his Padati, Jiva Goswami spoke about that in his Bhakti Sandarbha, and Nayan Ananda Thakur spoke that about his Preya Bhakti Rasarna in the context of Sakyarati. Eventually, Vishwanatha Kvarti Thakur, Baladev Vidyabhushan spoke. We find that in other Sampradayas as well, Balavacharya, no? even Rupa Goswami mentions Balavacharya, the Pushti Marg in his Bhakti Rasamriti Sindhu. So many other people spoke about that, but Rupa Goswami began it all. That's the point. So there is a very important place in our altar hmm, for him. Rupa Goswami established Hmm? The Melos of Raj, the, the, what Mahaprabhu was about, his own heart, he established that, he preached about that, he distributed that, hmm? all these sweet, relishable Melos of Raj, Brajras, according to the, again, the in, innermost desire of Sri Man Mahaprabhu. Hmm? So that's Rupa's contribution, which for you to fathom, at least to begin to try to fathom that. So in turn, Vishwanatra Kavarti Thakur, as a service to Rupa's contribution, he has write, written, as I mentioned, wonderful commentaries of Srila Rupa Goswami's works. No? On, again, Bhaktura Samrita Sindhu, Ujbal Nilam, and Ilagu and so on. And all of these works that Vishwanath wrote in, as a service to Sri Rupa are really filled both with Siddhanta and with Rasa, hmm? with philosophical conclusions, all in transcendental mellows. Very nicely he combined the two in his presentation. Especially in his commentaries as well on Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu and Ochwal Nilamani. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur wrote a commentary to the two of them. And of course in other books as I mentioned. So, <clears throat> so in the same way, in connection to this Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he composed a book called Madhurya Kadambini, as you know. And that book, the whole book is based on two verses <laughs> from Bhakti Rasambri to Sindhu, which Adho Shraddha, Tata, Sadhu Sangha, so on, which describe the nine stages from Shraddha to Prem. So two verses coming from Bhakti Rasambri to Sindhu, Vishwana composed a whole book, Madhurya Kadambini. So in the same way, and of course with this, he's given so much like a map for the Satakas to find their way <laughs> on the path. So in a very similar way, you know, like trying to give another complementary map, no? his cartography, transcendental cartography. He has similarly analyzed here some number of shlokas, as we will see eventually, of Bhakti Rasambri to Sindhu, in his Raga Marg, uh, regarding Raga Marg in this case, in this book. In this way also he has given so much benefit to the sadhakas, to the Raga Nuga sadhakas. So in the same way, again, as Vishwanath composed Madhurya Kadambini, to delineate the, 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 the general idea of the stages of bhakti in this Raghavarma Chandrika, he's also taking, quoting some verses of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, but mainly connected to the Raga Marg, for that to serve us as another further map in order to properly walk in this uh, path of Raghavarma Bhakti. Hmm? So, again, if we really closely examine Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's writing, we will see he's one of the main prominent Vaishnavs in the line of Rupa Goswami. Similarly to Krishna Das Kaviraj, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, as Guru Maharaj will say, you know, the Chaitanya Charitamrita is Krishna Das Kaviraj's understanding of Rupa Goswami or presentation of the heart of Rupa Goswami. So in a similar vein, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's life purpose, if you will, was to, to, to preach the internal mood of Rupa Goswami, to follow in such a mode to illuminate in that direction, to preach about that. So it's that's why I'm saying all, all, all this why, because in this Mangala Charan, that's why in this first verse, he's in the very beginning of his treatise, he's expressly, very specifically expressing his faith, his in-depthness uh, in, in relation to Rupa Goswami, by repeatedly offering obeisances to him, and very especially, again, to those Chakora, bird like devotees who are relishing the nectar of the words of Rupa Goswami to the Rupa Nugas, as we mentioned. So here, Vishwanath is offering pranam to both Rupa and Rupa Nuga, hmm? comparing this Rupa Nuga to 
chakora birds. So again, he's giving this chakora example, which only is surviving on moonlight. And he's thus continuing with the moonlight analogies because the whole book is called Raghavarma Chandrika, the moon beam, the moonlight that is illuminating the path of Rag. So the very poetic, sweet way Vishwanath is showing all this very clearly. So some words regarding the very first verse, which is the Mangala Turan of the, of the book. So with your permission, I will go to the second one, which also is somehow rather an introductory section of the book. In this case, the second verse of this first illumination will give, speak about the purpose of the book in a very general way. I will share some words now, but eventually we will go in further detail because here we are finding some general descriptions of what of those things that will be described in a much more uh, specific way later. So let me share the second uh, verse with you. I will share this in the chat in the chat as well in written form for you to have it if you like. <clears throat> so there's the verse. And uh, let, let's share the recite it in Sanskrit. It says like this. Shri Mat Bhakti Sudambho there, Bindurja Purbadarshita. Tatra Raga Nuga Bhakti, Shangshi Tatra Bindayati. So the translation says, the previously published Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu gave a concise description of Raga Nuga Bhakti. Now, in this Raga Bharma Chandrika, I will elaborate on this. So again, this verse has to do with the purpose of the book, like establishing what will be the book about, basically. So here he's saying very clearly this in connection to his previous uh, book about the Bhaktira Samrita Sindhu, which is the Bhaktira Samrita Sindhu Bindu. Bindu means a drop from the ocean, from the Sindhu of Bhakti Rasa or Bhakti Rasamrita, the nectarian mellows of devotion. So he, in that book, he's given just one drop of that. He mentions that was a concise description of Raga Nuga Bhakti because this book is also quite brief. So he's saying, now I will elaborate on that. I will expand upon that same content in this Raga Bhakti Sindhuka. So this uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu, which is mentioned here, is more like a booklet. And this book contains, yeah, it's like an, a drop. Take, he took one drop from the ocean of Rupa Goswami's composition, but contains the essence of Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, trying to make it easily understandable for everyone in a general way. So in such way, he describes shortly the main topics of, uh, of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, you know, the characteristics of devotion, Uttam Bhakti, the different kind of devotion, the 64 limbs of bhajan, I don't know, offenses to be avoided, definitions of Bhaiti Bhakti, Raga Bhakti, Again, in general, brief word, ways, no? the symptoms of bhav, prem, rasa, when it's awakening, what, how it feels, if you will, the ingredients of, of, of rasa, vibhav, anubhav, sattvika bhav, vyavichari bhav, stai bhav, and also the explanations of the different rasas, main rasa, secondary rasas, and the compatibility, incompatibility between all of them, rasa, basa, other topics that all of them are being dealt with in detail in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. But again, since to speak about the Raga Mark, going back to the topic of this book, since Raga Mark Bhajan is really a very extensive sub subject matter, this one, it is said that this one, Chakravarti Thakur was not fully satiated after speaking about that briefly in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu. He spoke about the Raga Mark there, but he was not fully satisfied with that. So similarly, no, I, I don't want to establish a full parallel, but like when Vyasa wrote all the Vedas, still he was not fully satiated and he had to re-edit the Bhagavad and eventually he found full satisfaction. So the, similarly here, Vishwanath wrote the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu, which is a very nice book, but he was not fully satisfied. So he described in a more elaborate way the method of Raganuga Bhajan here in the Raga Chandrika, trying to make it 
easy to understand for everybody. So that's our attempt here. As, as, as complex as the topic is, we'll try to, to go through that as easy as we can make it. Not, not, of course, not without avoiding all the necessary troubles <laughs> that we need to go through in our purification and our thread in the path. So basically, since this Renatia that Dagur took so much uh, effort and, 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 and intention in trying to make it much more available and much more user friendly to us, it is considered for us as Raga Marga Sadakas, it's our duty to study this book very attentively you know, as, as, a, as a way of being kind and reciprocating kind with what all of this Rana Chakravarti Thakur is trying to do for us to take benefit of this Raga Marga. So before proceeding and before finishing today's class, bear with me some few moments, I would like to, since here the word Raga is mentioned in the context of, of the book and also in the context of Raga Bhakti, um, with your permission, I will share some words uh, because it's necessary to know I'm speaking about Raga, or Raga Nuga. Well, let's share the basic meanings of the term Ram, Raga Nuga, which is mentioned the term Raga Nuga in this verse. And in order to speak about Raga Nuga, we'll also have to speak about Ragatmika, Bhakti and Raga in itself. And while doing that, we will make some brief also review of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu itself, what, what this book says about this. Although Vishwanath will speak about this in, the, in further verses, I think it's important to have a brief review or summary of this uh, like foundational terms, Raga, Raga Nuga, Ragatmika, and as Rupa Goswami presents them and as Vishwanath Chakravartita will further present them. So first of all, hmm, before speaking about Raga, Raga Nuga, Ragatmika, remember, let's speak about Bhakti, Uttam Bhakti, the type of Bhakti that Sri Rupa Goswami is trying to present in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sin. So he will speak about Uttam Bhakti having three stages, Sadhana, Bhav, and Prem. And in the context of Sadhana Bhakti, there will be two kinds of that, Bhaidi and Raga, or Bidi and Raga. And there will be a corresponding Bhav and Prem according to, to those two possibilities. So that's a general idea, but let's for a minute remember the definition of Rupa Goswami of Uttam Bhakti which is a very important verse of the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Actually, the whole book is revolving around this shloka. So I will be briefly, brief in describing this verse because the whole verse requires a whole uh, series of lectures, if you will. It's a very important verse, which uh, Rupa Goswami mentions like his, his own version of the famous Sarva Padi Vinir Muktam Tat Paratvena Nir Malam Rishikena Rishike Shivanam Bhakti Uchate from the Narad Pancharatra. And here he's describing Uttam Bhakti, topmost Bhakti, as having Swarup Lakshan and Tatasta Lakshan, main qualities and, and marginal attributes. So, marginal attributes, like we come as a byproduct of the main qualities, will be Anyabila Sita Sunyam Gyan Karmadhyana Bhutan. This type of Bhakti is totally sunyam, devoid of anya avilasita, of other desires, of separate selfish desires, and jnana karma adi nabritam. It's not covered by jnana, by karma, yoga, adi, adi means so on, etc. You know, yoga, tapasya, and so on. It's not covered, even though the devotee may engage in some of that some moment, in his conception, his bhakti is not covered by these ideas. Those are the tatasa lakshan, but the main qualities are, hmm, Anukulena Krishna Anusilanam Bhakti Rutama. Krishna Anusilanam and Anukul. So Uttam Bhakti is directed to Krishna. It has Krishna as its object, as its Visaya Lambana. He's, we will develop a Stai Bhavin connection to him. That's our deity, if you will. So that's at one point. It has to have Krishna as its object, not Bhakti towards my car, if you will, <laughs> or even to other, other forms of divinity, according to what Rupa Goswami is giving. Anusilanam means. Uh, it's a culture, an ongoing culture, engaging all the mind, body, speech, and so on. And Anukul, it has to be done, that culture, we have to be engaged with a favorable attitude, with a desire of pleasing Krishna. Not only doing things that are pleasing to Krishna, but doing those things with the intention of pleasing Krishna, which is a very important difference. Because Kamsa was absorbed in thinking about Krishna every day, 
And, and Krishna said, man, man, how? we think of me. And we say, well, Kamsa was following that. But he was not doing that with anukul, with a favorable mode. So that's also important. So all these five attributes of Uttam Bhakti were understood properly, you will get, there's a very unique definition that is totally excluding any other possible idea and given a very specific conception of bhakti. So Rupa Goswami begins the treatise with that. And then he defines sadhana bhakti because he mentions this bhakti is divided in three stages, sadhana, bhava, and prema. So sadhana bhakti means bhakti in practice, bhava, prem, bhava bhakti means bhakti in ecstasy, and prema bhakti means divine love. So he defines sadhana bhakti. He says, Kriti sadhya bhavet sadhya bhava sad sadhana vidha nitya siddhasya bhava sya prakatyam hiti sadhyata. So this important verse also. And here Rupa Goswami is saying, defining sadhana bhakti as uh, sadhana bhakti are those actions of the senses that take one to the stage of bhava. The goal of sadhana is bhava, and sadhana is mainly connected to the engagement of our senses in order to absorb our mind more and more. And this bhava bhakti says here is a saiva, eternal saiva, which is not created, but is simply manifesting in the soul through the spiritual energy of Krishna. In other words, bhakti is not inherent, <laughs> bhava is not inherent. So when we reach bhava bhakti, the sort of shakti coming from the nitya parishads or eternal associates descend and enlighten us in a particular way. I won't enter into detail now about this. Guru Maharaj gave a very wonderful series of lectures on, on Bhava Bhakti some time ago. You can find that in his YouTube channel. That's very recommended. So after describing Sadhana Bhakti, okay, this is Sadhana Bhakti, to engage with the goal of Bhava in mind, engaging our senses, trying to give pleasure to Krishna and so on. So Rupa Goswami then says, okay, there are two types of Sadhana Bhakti, Bhaiti Bhakti and Raga Bhakti. We will see this in more detail again, next class and further classes, but some idea for you too remain there. So Bhaiti Bhakti has its roots in the orders of the scriptures. And Raga Bhakti has its root in sacred greed. There are two different orientations, if you will. The scriptures, what the scriptures say, what to do, what not to do. And Raga means, I'm attracted to that. I don't know if I should be doing this or not, but there is some attraction, lova, sacred greed. Bhakti Nottakur sometimes gives the analogy, he says, for example, the excessive attachment that a conditioned soul expresses in related to, relation to sense enjoyment, we know what we are talking about here, you know, the materialist naturally feels an, atta an attraction, a greed, an attachment you know, with sense objects and many forms of sense enjoyment. You know? the, the materialist will naturally feel all this. It's not some forced thing in position. So that's called raga as well in the material sense. So in the same way, like the eyes, I don't know, become agitated when seeing something beautiful, mundane in the materialistic sense, all the senses are always eager to taste some pleasure. So the heart develops some form of rag for those sense objects. Like when you get attached to a food, for example, also, you may say, oh, I like that food so much. But nobody's telling you that you should get attached to it in samosas or sweet rice. It's just, it's natural. You taste that and you have a taste for that on some level. So the same, now what nobody's telling you, attached to that, but you do. Even if they say, do not do, and maybe you do. <laughs> do not eat that, you are sick, whatever. So Krishna, in this case, when we speak of Raga Marga, Krishna is the object of attachment, not sense objects. So this is Rag, and that's why this is called Raga Bhakti. Raga Bhakti means to that devotion that we are engaged mainly because of this strength of Rag or attraction, sacred greed into that direction. Rupa Goswami defined Raga Bhakti also and Ragatmika Bhakti in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. He says, Sara Siki Raga Bhavit Tanmai Bhakti Shastra Raga when, when defining Raga Nuga Bhakti, he has to define Raga Mika Bhakti because one is connected to the other. So I will share some brief words about this. And we will finish our meeting today, I think. So the, the description of Raga Bhakti, or of Raga basically, is a strong, deep, a natural absorption in the cherished object of one's devotion, arising from an unquenchable loving thirst. That's called Raga. Again, we may have an idea of that in connection to this world. <laughs> and now we are trying to 
Mm -hmm. to redirect that tendency with Krishna in the center. A strong, deep, natural absorption in the cherished object of one's attraction and love, arising from an unquenchable loving thirst is called rag. And bhakti that is impelled exclusively by such a thirst is called ragatmika bhakti. So here he's not describing raganuga bhakti, but ragatmika bhakti. Now we will describe what's this ragatmika bhakti because it seems quite intense. So rag, as you know, means color also in Sanskrit, rag, to color, to color the mind, that with colors. So if you have a, a lens of a particular crystal, red crystal, you will see everything red. Hmm? Everything is colored by your particular lens. So in the same way, when you have a very intense uh, attachment, extremely intense, you will see the object of your obsession, if you will, <laughs> everywhere, every time, at every moment. That's what happens in Vrindavan, especially in separation, as you know. Actually, the passions from this world are just a very weak, um, distorted, perverted reflection of the sacred, passionate love that we have the potential to develop in connection to Sri Krishna and Raj. Real rag, real rag, <laughs> is the, again, passionate obsession in, in connection to taste, to, to please Krishna. We'll see that especially in Raj again. That passion for serving Krishna will consume the whole consciousness of the devotees to such a degree that the point is the devotee won't be able to think about anything else under any circumstance, but only that, only that flow, that connection. There are so many verses in the scriptures speaking about that. You know? How the gopis, how the brajavasis are only thinking in that direction. There is no other idea able to enter into such a condensed absorption. So on this basis, here we are speaking of ragatmika. This is raga, we mentioned this is raga. So ragatmika means someone whose very essence or atmika or whose very soul and self, atma, is an intense attachment for Krishna, raga atmika. Someone who is made of attachment for Krishna, basically. Not, we are not speaking here about common, ordinary jiva souls, but eternal associates of Krishna, Nanda, Yashoda, Radha, Lalita, Vishaka, Subal, and so on. They are ragadmikas, which means they have always been there. They are composed, constituted of attachment for Krishna. They're, they are the very personifications of Rag. And which is the corresponding abode of such a, of, of such a feeling, of such a Rag, of course, is Brajadam. This is exclusive terrain from Ra, for Rag Bhakti. There we will find the topmost absorption in Krishna with topmost thirst, as we mentioned, is rag. And the devotion, again, which is filled with such rag, is called ragadmika bhakti. So this type of devotion is only present in the eternally perfect associates of Sri Hari in Raj, Nitya Siddhas. So we are not to develop ragadmika bhakti. We are to follow in the footsteps of the ragadmika bhaktas. That's a very important point we need to understand. We, when we hear from the sadhus about this excellent, this particular type of love of the associates of Krishna and Braj, who are fixed in this ragadmika bhakti, sometimes called also siddha bhakti, which is a perfect bhakti, eternally perfected bhakti. When we hear about them, then we start to thread this path of sacred truth, basically. In order to attain a similar feeling. Not to become them, that will be called Ahangra Pashana. I worship someone to become that someone, no. But to become them in the sense of, to become imbibed of their feeling, particular feeling of love for Krishna. That's called Raga Anuga Bhakti. Raga Anuga Sadhana Bhakti. The Raga Anuga, the, the path which follows Anuga, the Rag, the attachment. Which, which attachment? The one of the present in the Ragatmika, the Ragatmika Bhaktas. So we as sadhakas can follow in the footsteps of the eternally perfected people of Raj. So that's the path called Raganuga Bhakti. But we can never practice Ragadmika Bhakti because that's an that's a intrinsic, inherent treasure of the Nitya Parishads, the eternal a kind of retinue of, of Bhagavan in, in, in Sri Raj. You follow my idea? So Raganuga means to follow. This is a very important idea. Now, even interestingly, in Sanskrit, the, the person, when you have a, a personal experience, the word for that is anubhav. 
Anubhav is usually translated as experience. And what's the, 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 the two parts of the word Anubhav? Anu means to follow, and Bhav means the mood of someone else. Not to follow your own mood, but to follow the mood in this case for us of the inhabitants of Raj. So if you follow Anu, Bhav, the mood of them, you will have an experience, your own experience, in the case, in the context of Raga Nuga. So to, if we follow in the footsteps of them, all this will take us to an Anubhav, to a type of very specific personal experience. So finally, so we, I made it clear what's Raga, what's Raga Nuga, and what's Ragatmika Bhakti. So finally, to conclude today's talk, uh, so we are extending today a little bit more than usual, but first class always a little bit longer. <laughs> um, finally, Rupa Goswami, just to make this unfolding a little bit more clear, when we speak of Ragatmika Bhakti, he gives two types of Ragatmika Bhakti. I'm called Sambanda Rupa Bhakti or Ankama Rupa Bhakti or Sambandatmika Bhakti, just since we are speaking in terms of Ragatmika, we say Sambandatmika, Ankamatmika. So what's the meaning of this? No? Sambanda and Kama. It's the division corresponding to the wrath to the devotees, eternal associates in Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, and Madhurya. The ones who serve Krishna in Dasya, Sakya, and Vatsalya Rasa, they are in the category of Sambanda Atmika Bhakti. Hmm? Relational devotion. And the love of the gopis, the Raja Gopikas, is called Kama Atmika Bhakti or Kama Rupa Bhakti. Interestingly, as Guru Maharaj will say, Sambanda means relation, relationship. So the servants of Krishna have a relationship, official, confirmed one with Krishna, the, sir, the friends, they love Krishna as a friend and they should, their parents as well. But the gopis shouldn't be loving Krishna in the context of the parakya and dynamics, but they do. So that's not officially considered as a relationship because it's an extra-official extra affair, extramarital affair. But also at the same time, it's put in a separate category. Sri Jiva Goswami mentions this in his commentary to, to the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. It's, just, it's put in a separate category because it's the main uh, category, if you will. It's the main gift of Mahaprabhu as well. Uh, he's, he gives the example that when we say everyone is coming and the king is also coming. In one sense, he says the king is included in the idea of everyone. But special mention is there to the king. It's a special person. In the same way, Srila Jiva Goswami speaks this, Madhurya Bhav is the king of Rasa, so it has a separate category. And interestingly, for, as a proof of this type of love, they quote the last verse of the Gopi Gita. When Sri Radha uh, offers her, her breast for Krishna to put his feet so he may find some soft surface, and at the same time she's concerned about her breast, her breast being too rough and harsh, compared to the sweetness of, of Krishna's lotus feet and so on. So my point is, Ragatmika Bhakti, this eternal devotion present in the associates of Krishna and Braj, is divided in two. Sambanda Atmika or Sambanda Rupa Bhakti, or Kama Atmika or Kama Rupa Bhakti. So in the same way, since Raganuga Bhakti is following Ragatmika Bhakti, there will be, and since there are two types of Ragatmika Bhakti, we will have two types of Raganuga Bhakti. Which, depending if we follow Sambanda Atmika Bhakti or Kama Atmika Bhakti. So we will have Sambanda Nuga Bhakti, which follows Sambanda Atmika Bhakti in Dasya Sakya Vatsalya, or we will have Kama Nuga Bhakti, which follows in the footsteps of Kama Rupa or Kama Atmika Bhakti in the mood of the gopis. So some idea, again, I wanted just to give you a brief depiction of all this. There are so many other details, but it's already enough for today and also one last mention to finish today's talk is that we should be very in mind this is also Rupa Goswami makes that clear in his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu other forms I mean Raga Nuga Bhakti is all about absorption as you have seen the, the inhabitants of Raj are absorbed and the Raga Nuga Bhakti is trying to absorb in his mind his heart her heart in a particular mood but the point that this is the only path that will take us to Raj other types of absorption in Krishna won't take us to Braj. And this is a famous verse in the Bhagavad in the seventh canto, what Narada, Narada Moon is speaking. And he speaks to Yudhishthira and he says, he gives a list of examples. He says, My dear Yudhishthira, the gopis by their come, by their desire, romantic desires, Kamsa, by his fear, 
Sisupal and other kings by envy, the Yadus by their familial relationship with Krishna, you Pandavas, he's speaking to Yudhisthira, by your great affection for Krishna, and we, the general devotees, says Narada, by our devotional service, have obtained the mercy of Krishna. So the point is that in this verse it seems, oh, all of them attain the same thing through different um, vantage points, basically. But it's not like that. It's, this is, of course, a general idea. But it does, this doesn't mean that they, all of them attain Braj. That's the point we are discussing here. They, that they attain Krishna somehow or other, but they are not only one Krishna. We are interested in a particular <laughs> expression of Krishna called Braja Krishna. But some of them, like Sisupal and others, they attain Krishna in his, in his Brahman feature, basically, or other forms, not Braja Krishna. The Pandavas have Sakya, but in Bhai Bhakti mainly. Narada is also by the Bhakta. And so they mainly relate to him outside of Raj. What to speak of demons like Kamsa and Sisupal and so on. So my point is, for obtaining Raj, a very specific sadhana is required. We know the famous example of Lakshmi. She wanted to enter the Raj, as Mahaprabhu mentioned to, to Venkata Bhata, why she was not able to do that. Because she was performing a different sadhana. She was not engaged in Raganuga Bhajan. She was just performing tapasya. And when Krishna said which was the actual process, he said, you have to leave Narayan, your pati, your husband. You have to be, get married in Raj. <laughs> Eventually leave your husband there and come to me. And hold the ragamar. It was too much for him. <laughs> no? So we, but the point is for her, we need to establish a particular, follow a particular path. No? In, the, in, the, in the Bhagavad and also when in the prayers of the Shrutis, we find that. The Shrutis are praying to attain a body like the gopis, and only then, only then attain Raja Krishna. They know this. If we are to attain him in Raj, we need a particular form, and we need to follow a particular path for, for all that. So that's the point. No? With, only be, through this particular Raga mark, we will be able to obtain this particular goal that corresponds with what Mahaprabhu came to give with the ultimate gift of our Gaudiya Sampradaya. So some words I wanted to share today as an introduction basically to the whole treatise. Mm -hmm. And next class, following class next Thursday and the, and the eventual following classes, we will delve into much more detail about the specifics of all these generic definitions that I gave you till now about Raga Bhakti and all this. This was just a generic panoramic view. But we will enter into much more detail in the following meeting. So thank you very much for your time. And we have some minutes if you will like, if you have any questions, any doubts, we, we can share some more minutes here. Maharaj, I have maybe two questions. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, but I, I, I don't know if I, I am presenting it Let's see. In, a good, in a good way. Uh, the, first, the first one would be like, what does it mean that Prema Bhakti in the Vaidhi Bhakti perspective uh, is, is founded in, in scriptures? Because Prema Bhakti is divine love, it's, it's an emotion. So, so normally when I, I, I understand emotion, an emotion, uh, I think that we don't need to have this kind of love. We don't need to, to read something or to remember some uh, theoretical point of view or what somebody is saying, but it's something more compulsive or something like that. Uh-huh. Well, I will uh -huh. say... Yeah. yeah, first question. We will speak about that in detail in the future class. I will mention something, but I will go into detail in other classes, so I won't go into that detail now. But when we say that Bhai Bhakti is founded out of, on scriptures, we are speaking now on the stage of Sadhana Bhakti in Bhai Di. No? Bhai Di Sadhana Bhakti is depending on what the scriptures are saying, well, what to do, what not to do, and what will happen if you do not worship Krishna and you may have fear, or oh, if I do not worship, this will happen, so I will worship because he must be worshipped because he is God, eventually. So all that will uh, like progress in the form of a particular feeling. There is a feeling coming from doing all that, 
where will will where, where you will approach the divine being fully aware he is God. And eventually the type of love that you will attain in Vaikuntha has to do with that, with Aishwarya, that you are aware Narayan is God and I love him because he's God. That won't happen in Braj. Nobody loves Krishna in Braj because he's God, actually. That's the opposite. <laughs> No, they don't have the idea that Krishna may be God it represents a disturbance to their affection to Krishna, basically, generally. Although there are chances that that idea comes and somehow or other that nurtures their affection to see Krishna as a friend, as a lover. So that, that will be a brief answer to the question. I, I, does it help? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. Yes. We will speak in more detail in future classes. And there, there is a second one? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, when a uh, sadhu becomes a uh, sadhana siddha, uh, here, uh, practicing here in the material world, in the, yeah. in, uh, what uh, she or, or he will be doing uh, in Braja when he went to there? Because you were you were saying that that we will when when somebody becomes uh, Sadhana Sida uh, will not have the position of the Braja basis, mm -hmm. but but to follow the step of them. And yeah. what what would be the the the, the sadhana or the yeah. I don't know how to say. well basically uh, there will there is a subtle hierarchical distinction in, in that sense that I mentioned. Oh, I mean you cannot become a ragatmika in the same way like for example Nanda Yashoda. They are entities which are composed of swarup shakti. Meanwhile, we are souls that are composed of tatasta shakti. So that like categorical difference will always remain. Even if we become Siddhas and attain the Golok Vrindavan, still we are Tatasta Jivas, fully embraced by Sarup Shakti, of course, and that gives rise to our eternal identity. But still our intrinsic position is that, while the position of Nandan Jasoda will be different. There are Nitya Parishtats, like that, the hierarchical, categorical difference. But in practice, I mean, there's, generally the main point is that the ones who are associates are the role model to follow. And, and, the, and we are the ones who go there to follow in their mood. So in the dynamics of the daily service, for example, let's give an example, Rupa Goswami, he's Rupa Manjari, he's an eternal associate, it's not a sadhana siddha, nita siddha. If a devotee attains perfection, sadhana siddhi in, in, in Manjari Bhav, he will be a Manjari who will serve under the guidance of Rupa Manjari. So the, the, the way they will act and will serve Sri Radha in, in Golok will be similar. They will be engaging in different services as the one that are described in, in the esoteric scriptures of our tradition where they're describing detail what, what, what it's like there, what are they doing. But it's still the position, there's some little hierarchy there in the sense that Rupa Goswami will be our leader or even our Purvacharyas. That's the conception that is given in our school. No? If, if, if you go, I don't know, if you are disciple of Guru Maharaj, my Guru Maharaj, and you have an affinity towards Sakyaras and, and, and as he has, and as his Guru has, Prabhupada, your projection will be eternally, I will be serving in the group of Subal, but at the same time, not only under the guidance of Subal, but under the guidance of my Guru Maharaj, who will be the under the guidance of his Guru Maharaj, of course, in, in their Gopa forms. So all this, like Anuga, again, this idea of Anuga, which means to follow, no? Sri Asya Maharaj will say, Vaishnavism is indirect. It's not that I just run straight to Krishna. Krishna, me, rather than me. But there are so many layers of following no? our different previous acharas and so on. So, am I clear? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So here Mohini is asking something. If I can share the three books that I mentioned at the start that show Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur was very much in line with Rupa Goswami. One was Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, but I didn't, you didn't catch the other two. Okay, the other two is the Ujvala Nilamani Kirana. Uh, uh, let me, let me share the, one second. I can write it here. Okay. One minute. So you, that's what we got to. There you have the three, the three names. Ujvala Nilamani Kirana, the commentary on Ujvala Nilamani, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu, the commentary on Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and Bhagavatam Brita Kana, the commentary on Lagu Bhagavatam Brita Rupa Goswami. And all of them are available in English. They are all, the three of them are small booklets, like very 
user-friendly approach to monumental work of Rupa Goswami, <laughs> because all these three books, original works of Rupa Goswami that Vishwanath is commenting upon, they are really ex extends big. No? So these are the works. Something else, some other question? Maharaj, can I ask a quick question just in relation to what you were just talking about with um, Tatasta Shakti um, yes. devotees? So from what you're saying, it doesn't sound like there are any jivas that are nichasiddhas. The only nichasiddhas are parasiddhas, basically, um, um, completely of the Sri Shakti. Is that accurate? Or I don't know if what, I, I, what, what's your question. If all if all Nitya Siddhas are made of Sarup Shakti. Well, are they? I guess the question would be: Are there any Tatasta or Jivas, just Jivas, that are are Nitya Siddhas? Or are they? That's not possible because they're all Tatasta Shakti. Yeah, no, no, that's that's possible as well. Yeah. That's a possibility. I spoke with you okay. about, about that some years ago. And although the main, again, the main idea will be the need the Parishads, the eternal associates will be composed of Swarup Shakti. That's, that's the rule, if you will, but we can speak about the exception to the rule. And there's also possibility of that that's the Jeeva has been eternally liberated and that's being eternal associates there. And there is a chance for that. But again, mainly we will, Think in terms of the eternal associates there are made of Swarup Shakti. The main associates we know of, Nanda, Yashoda, Radha, Lalita, they are all Swarup Shakti Tattva, if you will. But there's also the possibility of some Nitya Parisat's eternal associate composed of Satasta Jiva. Yeah. What else? Something else before finishing? Okay. Yep. Yeah, I don't know. I saw Guru Bakya activating the. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah, Maharaj. I, sorry, I was late, and I don't know if you mentioned the particular editions of uh, of the text that you're working from. Are you working from different editions, or is like you can recommend some edition, for instance? Well, there are not that many editions actually in English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that at least that the two. I know of one is one published by Srila Naraya Maharaj, and another one is published by Ananta Das Babaji Maharaj. So they have some commentaries to them. I'm drawing some things from there, and as well, I'm drawing from other texts, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and well, Guru Maharaj talks, and some other things that come in the moment also. <laughs> but those are the two main uh, editions. Mm -hmm. So they are not too different between themselves at the same time. No, they are not too, mm -hmm. there are not too many different content between one and the other. And also, I will say, uh, yeah, basically that's the idea. No? I, I'm personally not recommending any of them, specifically not because they are not worthy of being recommended, <laughs> but just I'm, if you want, you can read them, but I'm trying, of course, to present the essence of both and, and, and some other things here in the seminar, but if someone would like to have some written, printed text or the verses and all this, you can see any of those too. In the case of Ananta Das Babaji's edition, I, I, he, may me, he may make some intensive emphasis or more exclusive emphasis in the direction of Manjari Bab, which is his own uh, affinity and, and speciality, if you will, and even also emphasis on the idea of Siddha Pranali, you know, of the conferring of the Kada mm -hmm. Bab. So that's in that sense, some devotees, if you are not properly acquainted with these things, uh, I wouldn't recommend you to go in detail with that because you may be a little bit like confused. So that's why also here that I'm speaking mainly to the audi audience of, of disciples of, of, my, of Guru Maharaj, that also there is the prospect for Sakya Bhav and all, all, I'm trying to present the conception of Raga Mark in a little bit more wide way and not only limited to the only possibility of Manjari Bhav and so on. So, that's why I, I have not recommended that like overtly officially, yeah. but again, it's not forbidden. Yeah, it works. You can you can go through them, no problem. But those things are to, are, are to be considered. My name. Uh... Thank you. Yeah. No, it's okay. 
Something else, some other question, commentary? <clears throat> okay, no more questions. We will stop here. Thank you very much to all of you for your time and see you next uh, Thursday. Hopefully, we will be continuing with the following verses of Sri Raga Bhatma Chandrika. Shula Gurudev ki jai, Sri Man Mahaprabhu ki jai, Sri Harinam Sankirtan ki jai, Sri Vishwanath Chakwarti Thakur Pad ki jai, Sri Raga Bhatma Chandrika ki jai. Nanta Koti Vaishnava in the Kijai, Gold Haribu.